In the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, medieval Europe was being significantly rocked by two major things. One of them was new shipbuilding technology, which allowed ships to go farther than they've ever gone before, and this newfangled idea that the world itself was round. Those two things led some brave adventurers to head out to uncharted waters and explore places they'd never been before, even discovering whatever, some lands that, that uh, they had never realized existed. Uh, I say that, whatever, you, you know why I put that in quotes. All right. So they, they, they did that. And, and frankly, some of these sailors that went out into uncharted waters, they found these places and they came back with stories to tell. But a lot more of them went out and died and perished along the way. Uh, it was a very treacherous thing to go out into the open waters. So much so that medieval map makers, when they would make maps, they, they would draw dragons and terrifying sea monsters out at the edges of their map because what else would explain why the, so many ships failed to come home? So they would, they would depict it in those ways. The sea was full of peril. But the thing is, this idea of the sea, this is not a new idea. This was not something that they invented in the medieval times. In fact, the, the, the perilous sea was something that, that people had been thinking about for thousands of years. The sea is deadly and chaotic. And, and the authors of the Bible, they're no exception to this. That's how they understood the, the ocean. You flip open the pages of the Bible and you see many, many references to the dangerous dark waters lying in wait beyond the shore. The sea is a central metaphor for the entire Bible. Uh, it's one of the central metaphors for all of Scripture. And when we understand it, when we start to see it on its own terms, we'll see how the biblical authors use this image, this metaphor of the chaotic waters of the sea as a way of both understanding the brokenness of our world and what God is doing about it. It's an important, important metaphor. So as Jeff said, this is the second week in our series, Threads. And, and all through this series, we are exploring these, these threads that weave throughout the entire Bible. Now, a quick recap in case you missed last week. I introduced an idea that this right here is not a book. It's not a book. The Bible is not a book. It is a library a library of scrolls. And so when we think about the Bible, I, I find it helpful to imagine not just re opening up a book, but actually walking into a library with shelves that have all these different scrolls on them. And some of them are written at different times by different authors and different, you know, sometimes things were great, sometimes things were terrible. These different scrolls, you can take them off the shelf and explore them. And, and they're all very diverse, but they tell a unified story that leads to Jesus. And all of these scrolls have one thing in common, which is that they were handed down to us by our spiritual ancestors. They handed down these scrolls. They entrusted them to us saying, within these pages, within these scrolls are the words of life. And so the goal for this series is to equip you to, to explore this library, to read these scrolls, to understand what you're reading on your own. Yes, we do that in our sermons on the weekend, but we want to equip you to be able to get more and more out of this library of scrolls as time goes on. So that's what this series is all about. And to do that, we're introducing you to these six key literary threads, these images, these ideas that weave through it all. And as I talked about last week, these are artistic, they're literary, they're, they're, this is literature. And so these images, uh, they invite us into a conversation. It's not just, okay, this is the image and that means this. It's, it, it invites us because these images are meant to be, to be wrestled with and thought about. Last week, we talked about the image of the tree of life, and this week, we're going to talk about the thread of the sea. Before we do that, though, let's dive into a little bit of prayer, and then we'll, and then we'll go on. Father God, um, I know that what we're about to talk about uh, might be a little different, a little bit weird, because we're going all over Scripture, and we're talking about uh, the sea and sea monsters and all this crazy stuff. But Father, I ask that in these moments we have together that your Spirit would, would speak clearly to us. I pray that as I preach, I would simply disappear and that your Spirit would remain. I ask that we would all have ears to hear what it is that you have for us today as we explore your Word. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, well, before we get into this library of scrolls itself, we have to take a step back and, and uh, understand the, the way that ancient people saw their world. That's going to help us understand where this metaphor is coming from. So in the ancient world, we, we have to talk about their, their cosmology. What was their understanding of how the universe worked? Well, put simply, ancient people believed that the earth was a flat disk covered by a dome, all right? Flat disk covered by a dome, kind of like that, the, the diagram that you see here. Uh, below us was the underworld. That's where dead people went to dwell. And, and above us, there's sky, and then there's the heavens, way over that, that dome called the firmament, right? Now, that was a pretty normal way for thinking about the world back then. Honestly, we thought that way until, until like, I don't know, only like five, six hundred years ago. So this, is, this was a pretty normal way for thinking about the world. Um, so, but here's what I don't want you to miss. And you can see it in that diagram there. Uh, yes, you, people knew that the sea was the end of the world because if you walked out to the end of the land, where the land ends, what do you find? It's the ocean, it's the sea. So that was a pretty normal thing. But they didn't just think of the sea as something at the edges of the map. They also thought of the sea as something below them and above them. They understood that the waters were deep below. The, this flat disk was resting on pillars, but it was kind of floating on the, the sea below. And... The waters also were above. They, the, the waters were above this firmament, this dome. I mean, why else would water sometimes leak out of the ground? Why else would water sometimes leak out of the sky? Because the sea surrounded, like what we lived in was like a little bubble in the midst of the waters, the dark, chaotic waters. And this was terrifying, frankly. This was a terrifying way to live. You could, you'd be pretty scared too, right? Living in a bubble like that. Because in the ancient mind, the cosmos, the universe that we lived in, was not just some static scene. Everything was intention, right? Everything was intention. At any moment, if you're surrounded by the, by the terrifying sea, it could break its boundaries, couldn't it? It could flood into our world and our calm, orderly existence would be suddenly filled with chaos. Which is why when you look back at ancient archaeology and ancient writings, you find that, that almost every culture back then had, had myths to, to help them understand this tension between order and chaos. It showed up in their theology. Uh, they, they had, you, you look at a lot of different cultures had this, this motif of the storm god battling the sea god because that helped them understand the, the tension in our world. For example, Babylonia, or in, in Babylon, the Babylonians had a creation mythology um, called the Enuma Elish, and in it, there's this god Marduk, who's kind of like a storm god, and he goes to war against the chaotic sea waters personified, this, this scary monster, sea monster uh, called Tiamat, and they fight, they battle it out, and he ultimately reigns supreme. He, he rips her body in half, and he makes the land out of one half and the sky out of the other half. And, but, but it's the storm conquering over the sea, and that's why things are orderly the way that they are. That's how the Babylonian, Babylonians understood their world. I, I could go on and on. There's a lot of other examples like that, but you get it. You get it. In the ancient mind, the chaotic waters of the sea, the deadly waters of the sea, were always threatening to undo the order of our world. Okay? Now, this worldview of theirs, it did not bring comfort. This was not meant to bring comfort. This worldview, though, it did bring clarity. It brought clarity. Because when you look at your life and you think, why is there so much death and, and violence and disease and pain and injustice in our world? Well, it's because chaos was always just a breath away. It was always trying to, to break into our world. That was their, their worldview, their cosmology. That was their understanding. Now, I tell you all this because the biblical authors were no different they also were ancient people living in an ancient world. That they shared the same basic cosmology as everyone else in their world. But when you look at how this thread of the sea weaves through Scripture, what you find is that there is one significant difference between the way that the, the biblical authors think of it and everybody else in that time. One major difference. Throughout this whole library of scrolls, there is no struggle, no struggle between God and the sea. Because our God is the creator of all of it, of everything. And the sea, 
does exactly what he commands. Let me show you what I mean. At the, and by the way, you can try to follow along. We're going to look at a bunch of different passages of Scripture, so feel free to flip with me, or I'll have the passages up on the screen. But if you go to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, easy to find, page 1, uh, you see that, that the Israelite creation story is kind of like a finger in the eye of the Babylonians. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean. Here's how the first scroll in this library begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So, the beginning of the story in the Israelite mind was that the sea covered everything. Now, it says that, that, that everything is formless and empty. The Hebrew words for formless and empty are tohu wabohu, tohu wabohu. And it, it's kind of hard to translate, but it's kind of like wild and waste or a formless void or put simply chaos, tohu wabohu. That was everything. The sea covered it all. And so our creator God, a God of order, decides to bring order out of the chaos, so how does he do it? Does he, does he grab his spear? Does he, does he go to war against the sea? No, no. Here's what he does. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a space between the waters. That's the bubble, right? The bubble of creation. Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. A few verses later, then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas, and God saw that it was good. All right, so that's how things begin in the Bible. You can see, first of all, this is describing that same ancient cosmology I talked about before, right? Flat disk, dome, uh, God creating this bubble of order and creation surrounded by the chaos waters everywhere else. But the big twist, as I said, the big twist is that all of this order, it's not like wrestled out of, out of chaos by some titanic struggle. God simply speaks and it happened. God speaks and the chaos waters obey. To the biblical authors, our creator God is not just one among equals like Marduk, who maybe is a little bit stronger than the rest. No, he's one of a kind. There is no God like our God. That's the biblical idea. So this right here, this is the first aspect of this biblical thread that you've got to understand. Our God is the master of chaos. Our God is the master of chaos. And you see this idea picked up like all throughout the Bible. For example, it's Psalm 104, one of my favorite Psalms. Uh, the author says, you, God, you place the world on its foundation, right? There's those pillars so that it would never be moved. You clothed the earth with floods of water, water that covered even the mountains. At your command, the water fled. At the sound of your thunder, there's the storm God, right? The sound of your thunder, it hurried away. Mountains rose and valleys sank to the levels you decreed. Then you set a firm boundary for the seas so they would never again cover the earth. In other words, everyone might feel terrified by the chaotic waters threatening to pour into our world at any moment, but we have nothing to fear because the seas of chaos obey our God's command. Now, this same concept shows up everywhere you read about Leviathan in the Bible. Leviathan, it, it's a lot in the Old Testament. It's kind of like a, a, a chaotic sea monster, just like Tiamat. Uh, Leviathan is, is like the, the chaotic seas personified. And when you read through Scripture, whenever you see Leviathan show up, it's the same idea. Leviathan is no threat to God. All right, this is in Job 41, for example. God says to Job, can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? In other words, because I can, right? I can do that. Will, will it beg you for mercy, Job, or implore you for pity? If you lay a hand on it, you'll certainly remember the battle that follows. You won't try that again. In other words, as humans, we are at the mercy of this terrifying sea beast, Leviathan, but God has complete mastery over it. 
In fact, Psalm 104 takes it even farther. And Psalm 104 describes Leviathan as something that God creates, this creature that God creates to be like a, like a sea puppy, just to frolic in the sea. Like it, Leviathan is God's rubber ducky is kind, of, is kind of how it is, right? That, that, this same idea, what you see is that, is that the sea and its Leviathan are no threat to our God. Our God is the master of chaos. So this, this is a foundational truth to understand. When we're trying to seek the scriptures for answers to questions like, why is our world so broken and what is God doing about it? Because the chaos of our lives is not just some existential or mythological idea. It's real, isn't it? The chaos that we face, it's the human condition. We face death and pain and violence and injustice all the time. It's a part of our lives. Our world is chaotic. So what is our God of order doing about it? Well, this is where things get really interesting to me. Because when you, when you see this, this biblical thread start showing up, you can start to understand that the biblical authors are asking that same question. I mentioned last week that these biblical threads are dynamic. They don't always mean the same thing. And so what we start to see is that these, these biblical authors start playing with this idea of the sea. And they start, they start interpreting it in ways that, that raise some provocative questions. And, and again, as, I've, as I mentioned, draw us into the conversation. That's why art is art, because it, it draws us in to, to be a part of its interpretation. So let's take a look at how this thread of the sea develops through the Bible and, and see how it kind of connects with the narrative of Scripture. Early on in the, the Genesis scroll, humanity has pretty clearly corrupted God's good creation. Right? He creates this beautiful, orderly place, and right out of the gate, we corrupt it with evil and, and uh, disorder and injustice and pain and death. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. And so we make chaos... Out of, out of God's good order, and what is he going to do about it? Well, in that first scroll, what God does is he returns chaos to chaos. He releases his hold on the, the waters of chaos, and he lets these terrifying floodwaters come back into our little bubble, right? He, he only spares one righteous man, Noah, and his family, and then two of every creature on a little ark. And that ark is itself kind of like a little mini bubble of order on these terrifying, chaotic seas. But then what does he do? He speaks, or rather he breathes, and the waters recede. They do, they obey what he's asking them to do. And then he gives the humans a rainbow, as a sign that never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Now look, we could talk for a very long time about the theological ramifications of the flood story. Look, if you're a skeptic like me, it, it, it's one of those stories that causes all kinds of consternation in your, in your attempt to understand who this God is, killing all the creatures and people on the earth. I get it, okay? If you're, if you're a skeptic and you want to talk about it with me, come talk about it with me because I've been thinking about this for a very long time. I'd love to just interact with you about it. But, but suffice it to say, the point is, when we're looking at the literary structure of Scripture— it's important to see how this story of the flood fits in with, with the ancient cosmology of the Israelites. The existential threat, right, of, of the chaos waters flooding in, that is exactly what happens with the flood. God lets it happen. But then he makes this promise with the rainbow. He, he's, it's a way of saying that God's very good creation from this point on is here to stay. The seas of chaos will never win the day. They're not going to win. Okay, so that raises a new question. We're, we're, we're invited into this conversation, so we're saying, okay, so if God's not just going to flush away all the, the evil and sin and corruption of humanity again, then, then how is he going to deal with it? What is he going to do? Well, the narrative goes on. And in, in the Genesis scroll, we see the beginnings of a story where God chooses a people. He, he chooses a family, Abraham's descendants, the Israelites. And he promises that order and life and, and abundance and blessing will come into the world through them. That's how he's going to do it. He's going to bring order and life through this chosen people and eventually through to, to all families on earth. But you can see pretty quickly that the sea chaos puts up a fight, 
right out of the gate, we see that, that uh, the Israelites find themselves in slavery to the Egyptians. And there are literary hints that talk about the Egyptians as if they are kind of like Leviathan themselves. Like, it's, like they are chaos personified. And so, so God, uh, God releases his people from slavery in Egypt, and then the Israelites are fleeing Pharaoh's army. And where do they find themselves? They find themselves facing the Red Sea on one side with this Leviathan of an army chasing them down on the other. So what does God do? What does God do? Well, he does what he always does. He speaks and the waters obey. The waters, the sea splits and the people of Israel walk across on dry land. Here's what they sing on the other side. At the blast of your breath, God, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood straight like a wall. In the heart of the sea, the deep waters became hard. The enemy boasted, I will chase them and catch up with them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. So in this case, in this case, God has returned chaos to chaos but he has allowed his people to live in the order of dry land. His order wins the day. His mission to, to bless the world through this family continues. But of course, if you keep the narrative going, what happens? The Israelites themselves start to bring a whole lot of chaos into this world. They start to resemble the Egyptians. They bring injustice and pain and death into the world. They bring chaos. And almost immediately, it seems like, like God's mission is threatened now by his own chosen people. So what is God going to do? His own people are now corrupting this world. Is he going to flood the world again and, and wipe it all clean? No, because he said he wouldn't do that. He's got to do something else. So what does he do? He steps into the story himself. That's when we start to read about this, this man, this this rabbi, this healer named Jesus. But the story makes us wonder, is he really just a man? This is what happens in Matthew 8. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now that story right there, that is a great example of why understanding these biblical threads is so important. Because if you're not paying attention to the world of the text, right, how this passage connects with the th biblical threads that weave into it and through it, if you're not paying attention to that, then this is just a story about how Jesus had some weird superpowers or something like that, right? But when you think of this in terms of the, the narrative of the sea and how, how God is working to bring order into our world, suddenly you realize that this, that you look what happens in the story. Jesus speaks and the, the seas obey. Who does that remind us of? Yeah, our God, our creator God is among us. That's what this story is telling us. Now we can start to see God's plan for dealing with chaos revealed. He's not just holding back the waves. He is stepping into the story as one of us, healing our broken creation, bringing order and life and justice from the inside. And his kingdom, this kingdom of life and, and hope and love, will conquer the forces of chaos once and for all. That's what the biblical authors promise. In fact, when you come to the end of our Bible, the author of Revelation picks up on this exactly. He says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. In this vision of the new creation, there is no more sea. Why? Because chaos is defeated forever, and with it, 
death and mourning and pain. Our God is the master of chaos, and because he stepped into our story, Jesus Christ will defeat chaos for good. So that is the biblical thread of the sea, or at least a tiny, tiny little bit of it. There is so much more that we could have talked about. If, if I had your permission to talk for an hour and a half, we could have easily done that, but I'm not going to bore you. It's a Memorial Day weekend. It's not a, probably a good thing to do. We could have talked about how the prophets use the roaring of the enemy nations around them, and they use the same word as the roaring of the seas. That's really compelling. There's this whole really interesting prophecy in Habakkuk 3 where the, the prophet envisions God as literally the storm God, and he's sending bolts of lightning like spears, and he's bringing pestilence, and he's going to war against the sea. He just leans right into that ancient worldview. It's, it's fascinating. Or we could talk about Psalm 74, for example. Psalm 74, uh, we're not going to get into it today, but that is your take-home passage for the week. Every week in this series, we want you to take home a passage, read it on your own. Psalm 74 is, is compelling in light of this whole idea of, of God being the master of chaos because, because Psalm 74 is written by a psalmist who is like, God, are you still there? Like, I don't feel like my world is very orderly, God. Basically, he's saying, God, you used to be the master of chaos, so why aren't you acting like it now? How long are we going to have to wait for you to bring order and justice into my life? It's pretty provocative, right? That's what the scripture is. It's provocative. Read Psalm 74 sometime this week and see how it connects with you, especially if you think this idea of order seems perhaps a little bit far-fetched. For now, though, for now, what I want to do is I want to lean in a little bit to that idea of what you're going through. I want, to, I want to make this personal because I know I just dumped a ton of information on you about like cosmologies and sea monsters and all that, right? That's a lot. That's a lot. So I just want to talk about what this means to you and to me right now. What I want you to hear and, and just take away from this is that this grand narrative struggle of the Bible between order and chaos, uh, between a world created, a world corrupted, and a world redeemed, that grand narrative, in that story, you and I have not yet reached the conclusion. We don't live at the end of the story yet. Yes, we know where things are headed. We know that when Jesus came into our world, he changed everything for us but we are still living in the not yet. We're living in the not yet. We're living in the world of Psalm 74. How long, O oh Lord, aren't we? Because our world is still broken. We're still facing the challenges of our lives. Yes, as Christ followers, we have absolute confidence of what is coming. We know that our destiny is certain in the new creation with resurrected bodies like we've been talking about. We know that that's all true, but we live in the not yet. We live in the not yet. You and I, we have to wrestle just like the biblical authors did with the fact that, that our world is still chaotic. Our world is still broken. And bottom line, I cannot answer for you why God doesn't just snap his fingers or, or more accurately, why he doesn't just speak and the chaos of your life goes away. I don't know why he doesn't do that. All I know is that we are still invited to join him as he does that work of bringing order. All we can do is accept the invitation to join him in that story. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read one more passage of Scripture that I think, in light of this conversation, will be very relevant. But I want to do it, and I want you to inhabit the story. I want you to be a part of that story. Enter the conversation. Enter the story. Because, because we all face chaos of one kind or another. In fact, take a second. Just take a second. Maybe close your eyes if it'll help your focus, but just take a second and think about the chaos of your world. What are you facing right now? Is it, is it brokenness? Is it the chaos of grief? Maybe it's anxiety or depression or pain, physical, mental. Maybe it's fear, disease or illness. Maybe it's addiction. Just take a second and, and ask yourself, what is your chaotic sea? 
What is it that's threatening to, to burst its boundaries and come flooding into your life? Now, with that in mind, place yourself in this story. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. What are your waves? About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the Son of God. Well, Father God, I know that leaning into this conflict of the the chaotic world that we're living in, the not yet that we're living through, It it, it may be tempting for us to, to lose hope, but I really believe, God, that the biblical authors, through the power of your Holy Spirit, are inviting us to find hope even in the midst of the not yet, even in the Psalm 74 world that we're living in. And so, Father, my prayer is that for every one of us, regardless of what our chaotic seas are, I pray that you would give us hope that you are with us, that you are walking with us, that you have complete mastery over the waters of chaos, and that, Father, we are, we are going to see all things made new one day. Would you give us that hope? Would you give us that confidence? And would you allow us to stand strong even in the midst of the waves, knowing that you are not finished yet? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church. And the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.